right, I want to welcome everybody back to class tonight. Uh, let's get right into our hymnology portion of it as we look at a very familiar song. It uh, goes way back many, many years. This one's called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. This one was written way back in the middle 19th century, and it's one that's been enjoyed all around the world ever since. Someone has well penned this statement that a Christian's practical theology is often his hymnology. And many of us could attest to this as we recall some deeply moving experience, perhaps the loss of a, deep, a dear loved one, and a simple hymn which has been used by the Holy Spirit to minister to our spiritual need. Such a hymn is what a friend we have in Jesus. Though it is not considered to be an example of great literary writing, its simple stated truths have brought solace and comfort to countless numbers of God's people since it was first written in 1857. So relevant to the basic spiritual needs of people are these words that many missionaries state that it is one of the first hymns taught to new converts. The very simplicity of the text and music has been its appeal and strength. Joseph Scriven was born in 1819 of prosperous parents in Dublin, Ireland. He was a graduate of Trinity College in Dublin. At the age of 25, he decided to leave his native country and to move to Canada. His reasons for leaving his family and country seemed to be twofold. The first would be the religious influence of the Plymouth Brethren upon his life estranged him from his family and also the accidental drowning of his fiancée the night before their scheduled wedding. From that time, Scriven developed a totally different pattern of life. He took the Sermon on the Mount literally. It is said that he gave freely of his limited possessions even sharing the clothing from his own body if necessary, and never once refused to help anyone who needed it. Ira Sankey tells in his writings of the man who, seeing Scriven in the streets of Port Hope, Ontario, with his saw buck and saw, asked, Who is that man? I want him to work for me. The answer was, You cannot get that man. He saws wood only for poor widows and sick people who cannot pay. Because of this manner of life, Scriven was respected, but was considered to be eccentric by those who knew him. What a Friend We Have in Jesus was actually never intended by Scriven for publication. Upon learning of his mother's serious illness and unable to be with her in far off Dublin, he wrote a letter of comfort in closing the words of this text. Sometime later, when he himself was ill, a friend who came to call on him chanced to see the poem scribbled on scratch paper near the bed. The friend read it with keen interest and asked Scriven if he had written the words. And of course, Scriven, with his typical modesty, replied, The Lord and I did it between us. In 1869, a small collection of his poems were published, and it was simply entitled Hymns and Other Verses. After the death of Joseph Scriven, also by accidental drowning, the citizens of Port Hope, Ontario, erected a monument on the Port Hope-Peterborough Highway, which runs from Lake Ontario with the text and these words inscribed. Four miles north, in Pengali Cemetery, lies the philanthropist and great author of this great masterpiece, written at Port Hope, 1857. Now, the composer of the music, Charles C. Converse, was a well-educated, versatile, and successful Christian whose talents ranged from law to professional music. Under the pen name of Carl Redden, he wrote numerous scholarly articles on many subjects. And though he was an excellent musician and composer with many of his works being performed by the leading American orchestras and choirs of his day, his life is best remembered for this simple music that, he, that was so well suited to Scriven's text. Ira D. Sankey discovered the hymn in 1875. We all know that he was the choir leader for D.L. Moody. Just in time to include it in his well-known collection, Sankey's Gospel Hymns No. 1. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that. I think it would be pretty good. Later, Sankey wrote this. The last hymn which went into the book became one of the first in favor. Forrester, if you would, jump on the piano. We're going to sing all three verses of what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> And just to make sure that we all sing the same words, I got myself a church hymnal, and I'm going to use it, okay? <laughs> Hope you don't mind. All right, all three verses. Oh, I meant to do that for you, sorry. <laughs>
Forrester, appreciate that. Fantastic. Okay, well, like Brother Jason stated earlier today, I don't have room to spare tonight, so we're going to have to get right into it. I don't even have the opportunity to chase me rabbits because I have packed this thing full. One of the reasons that all I gave you was an outline is because the outline is four pages long. <laughs> if I gave you notes, we'd have probably ten pages of paper, then your homework, and then I'm going to give you an exam at the end of the class. Somebody say amen. amen. That's what I thought. <laughs> all right, so let's get right into it tonight. So we've spent most of the time talking and addressing uh, the congregation and the adult choir. Last week, we addressed specifically the youth choir. Tonight, I want to talk about the children's choir and all the things and intricate details that should be invested into the development of the children. The first thing that you have to remember is that your children are the future of the church. And the way that you teach them and you train them in their childhood will greatly determine the outcome that you will receive later on in the church itself. Now, the, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. So we must, we must look at this as and see a vision of how God can use the young ones that are in our church tomorrow. But we must train them today. Also in the book of Proverbs, in chapter number 22, verse number 6, the Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. So the important thing is for us to remember that the time that we invest, the techniques that we use to invest, and all the things that we do in these little kids is very important. Many people believe that you'll receive more rewards and see much more fruits of your labor just in the little kids. Now you'll always have the adult choir and they'll always have your, you'll always have your faithful few and you'll always have those that are the unfaithful few. But with the kids, just a little bit of time, a little bit of spit and polish, and you'll see much more dramatic improvements in them because they're like raw clay. Up until this point in their life, most of them have never had any kind of musical exposure or musical training. So it really is up to you in order to mold them and to help them learn and have a good, solid foundation for the rest of their life and in order to be useful in the ministry in years to come. So... You also need to remember that this is also an opportunity, more than anything, to win children to Christ. That we use biblical gospel songs to instill within them the truths of the Bible, to teach them the stories of the Bible, because you and I can attest to the fact that the songs that we learned as kids that taught us about Noah and the ark and, and, and all kinds of different things you can think of, they all just burned in our minds, and that's what really helped us to remember that it was Noah and not Moses that was on the ark. You can confuse a lot of people and ask them, how long was Moses on the ark? And somebody will stand up and say, 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> but the truth is, Noah was on the ark and it was for longer than 40 days and 40 nights. Most people don't even know their Bible well enough to realize that she just completely duped them. But if you teach kids from the very beginning, we'll have a new generation of children that will come up. Number one, be born again. And number two, to have a very solid understanding of biblical principles. Now, the, the early ages of the children's choir typically begin when they're about four years old, when they're pre-K age and things like that. Now, you may allow any age to be in your children's choir. I, I really don't have a cutoff that I can think of, but most of the time, they're not going to really understand, and they're not really going to pay attention or really learn until they're of learning age, which is usually around four or when they're in pre-K. So that's where we're going to begin. You can have a three-year-old in your, in your church choir if you want to. That's not a big deal, but that's how we're going to kind of break it down. I'm going to break down the children's choirs into three different sections. Lord willing, the objective here, obviously, as with anything, is to create enough interest and to have enough, enough participation and growth in the future that you will be able to have enough kids to divide them more selectively and appropriately so that, because as you're going to learn tonight, children at different ages have vastly different understandings and, and uh, concepts of the world around them. A four-year-old sees the world completely different than a ten-year-old. A ten-year-old feels like he's a senior citizen compared to a four-year-old. But if you're like me, you don't have a whole bunch of kids beating down the door and flooding your room for rehearsal time or to even sing in front of the church. So it would be pointless to have three different children's choirs. But I want to teach you the three major divisions of the ages of children so that you have an understanding of how to be able to reach all three age groups, especially if you have them all lumped into one group like I do. That makes it very difficult, but nevertheless, it's still very important. 
So let's begin with the beginner age, pre-K and kindergarten. Now the main purpose of this age group is purely educational. If all you have are a bunch of four and five year olds, you're probably not going to get much out of them and not going to get much use out of them in the service. Most of the time when they get in front of a crowd, the biggest thing they can think of is to pick out mom and dad and to wave to them. And that's about all you're going to get out of them. You're not going to get a whole lot of service and participation. So if you have enough kids where you can have a, a, a beginner choir, don't look forward to using them in the service a lot. It's probably going to be distracting. And let's be honest, visitors aren't excited to see your kids and how cute they are. Most of the time they're visiting because they want to hear the Word of God preached and not see your kids climbing all over each other and fighting to see who's going to be in front in front of the microphone or whatever. Because they always want to be seen. So remember that the biggest part of having these kids involved is to teach them, to help them get a good, solid beginning in their musical understanding for the future and the use of the ministry in the church. These children, most, uh, more than anything, if not totally, learn simply by imitation. You can't expect them to read unless they're extremely gifted, so that's out. You can't expect them to really understand a whole lot. That's out. Really, what you have to learn is how to teach them by imitation, or the correct word would be by rote, R-O-T-E, rote. So teaching them by imitation or rote would be the format that we want to use for this age group. This age of child has a very at short <laughs> attention span, especially if they don't receive much discipline at home. If they are allowed to run wild and do as they please at home, when they get into your rehearsal room and when they get into the, the children's choir, don't expect them to actually listen because they're not taught to listen. I experienced that. I have a child in my uh, children's choir that if all you do is just call their name, it makes them so upset that they get up and walk out and go tell their mom. I welcome the mother to come in there and say something or to observe how the child behaves. And it has happened. And I appreciate that. Because they need to understand, I'm not the one that's got the problem. I'm just trying to teach the kids how to sing. And if the kid is turned around, messing with this kid, staring out the window, throwing things, blowing bubbles with their bubble gum, things like that, that's not what we're there for. And if all I do is say their name and say, I want you to sing, you know, I'm not threatening to hit them over the head with a chalkboard or anything. I'm just saying, I, look, at, look at me, okay, look right here, look at the music, just watch me, listen to me, something. Trying to do it with big expressions and smiles. And they get up and get all mad and they run out and like, hmm, you know, they're done. I'm thinking, okay, there's something seriously wrong with, with this situation here. And you're going to have to handle that. You're going to run into that. Because not everybody has grasped the concept of discipline. That's why we've got so many kids that are winding up in jail and shooting each other and shooting themselves. Because they're not taught self-control and anything. They're not taught to respect any kind of authority, especially mom and dad. So you're going to run into that. So remember, their attention spans are going to be on, off, on, off. So try your best to work with them, but keep that in mind. One of the ways that you can really get them involved and latch onto their attention for a little bit longer is to use large movements and gestures. Don't just stand there and be mundane and monotone. You've got to really move and you've got to really get them to, to engage with you and get them involved with what you're doing. Because that's what they're used to getting when they're playing video games and watching TV and doing this and doing that. Things, bright lights and flashing lights and all kinds of moving objects. It's no wonder that kids get bored when they come to church. They're so used to a world that's going boom, 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 boom all the time. And they come to church and they're made to sit still. Well, supposed to be. <laughs> and supposed to be quiet. But oftentimes they don't and they're not. So it's no wonder that kids are often a little bit of a holy terror when they come into the house of God. So... Be prepared. Use large movements. Now, at this age, it is not a good idea to use any kind of a reward system or a competitive environment. If you're going to give a prize to this age group, you give a prize to every kid because they do not understand why I didn't get one. They have not reached that level of understanding yet. So if you're going to give out a prize for the person that attends the most, the one that's always on time, this, that, and the other thing, Give a prize to every kid because they are not going to understand. They will not grasp that. So keep that in mind. Um, songs that you pick out for this age, age group really need to be, well, the key word here is brevity. Be brief. Use simple 
brief songs that repeat a lot. Um, like the B-I-B-L-E. I mean, that's perfect for this age group. They get it, and that opens the door, as you're going to see here in a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and march through that door and come back and shut it and come back through it again. But that's a perfect opportunity for you to explain to them what the Bible is, why the Bible is important, and explain to them the song, I stand alone on the Word of God. Most kids don't understand what that means. That phrase means nothing to them. They just say it because that's what you told them to say. Teach the kids to understand why we stand alone on the Word of God, why it's not the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer, why it's not the Bible and this uh, lexicon or the Bible and this commentary, the Bible and this man's opinion. That is the Word of God. We are silent where it's silent. We speak where it speaks. When God's Word says, do this, we do. When it says, thou shalt not, we shall not. Teach the kids at an early age to stand alone on the Word of God. And then you can go even further and, ex and try to help them understand. Don't go into any kind of a lesson plan, but let them know if you want to throw it in. Um, you, you, could, you could change the words a little bit, and instead of saying the, the B-I-B-L-E, you could change it to the... The KJV for me or something like that, you know. <laughs> Help them to understand that it's the King James Bible that we hold to be the one that God has put his seal of approval and stamped his protection upon because he has preserved it for hundreds of years so that English-speaking people have a clear understanding of what God thinks, God says, and God requires. If we don't, we'll have a generation of kids that come up and think as long as it says Bible on it, they think it's okay. Then they'll start bringing the Queen James Bible with them to church. And you're in all kinds of trouble if that happens. So use the opportunity that you're given to teach to them. Now, teaching a beginner age child to sing is an art form in and of itself. So I've given you a 10-step little suggestion of how to introduce new songs to them and to help them understand them. First thing you need to do is you need to stir up interest to them about this new song. Just don't come in there and say, all right, we're going to sing a new song. Everybody listen. And you start running into it. You want to kind of give a background story about it. Try to build it up and create in them excitement and a desire to want to learn. Because what, what other kids want, kids want. So if you create one kid that really wants to learn to sing this song, other kids are going to want to learn to sing the song too. So the first thing you need to do is introduce the song and kind of tell them what it's about. I taught my kids how to sing Let's Talk About Jesus Sunday. It's a very good song that's fairly repetitious and fairly brief. It just goes, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk of His love. Let's talk about Jesus and heaven above. Let's talk about living for Jesus our Lord. Let's talk about Jesus and live in His Word. And that's it. So we're singing through twice, and it's fairly repetitious. It's simple for them to understand. But in order to get them to listen to me, I have to explain to them that there is nothing greater for you to talk about than to talk about Jesus, to talk to Jesus, to your friends and to your family, even to your teachers. Tell them about how wonderful God is and how much love God has for us, that He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for your sins and for mine. And by then, they're going to be like, all right, what else you got? <laughs> and you're going to have the opportunity then to go to step two, and you'll just sing through the song for them. Let them hear with the piano what it's going to sound like. Then you want to go over any difficult words that may be found in that song. Um, not really any difficult words in Let's Talk About Jesus, but in, in some songs you want to try to explain big words or words that maybe have more than two syllables in them to help them really get through that and to understand. The last thing we want are for kids to sing just what they hear rather than understanding and knowing what they're singing and what they're singing about. So from the very beginning, in the beginner's age, we want to make sure we go over these words and explain them to them. Then after you've done that, it's a good idea to speak it to them in rhythm, not singing it this time, but speaking to them in rhythm. Because rhythm is also something very crucial that we teach kids from an early age. So you would step back and you would do the song like this. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk of His love. Let's talk about Jesus and heaven above. Let's talk about living for Jesus the Lord. Let's talk about Jesus 
and live in His Word. Okay? So speak it to them in rhythm. Then give them a special something to listen for as you go through the song, because you're going to sing it again. This time, instead of them just getting an overview of it, get them to look for ways to pay attention. Like if they've learned to count, ask them to count how many times you say the word talk. Because we're talking about Jesus the entire song. So get them, give them something, lay some kind of a, an objective or a goal before them to cause them to want to pay attention to the song. If you just have one that answers you, it'll create a desire in the other kids to be the one that gets it right next time. So ask them to pay attention for special points of interest while you sing through it again. Now the kids still aren't singing with you, they're just listening. Remember they learn by imitation, by rote. After you sing it through it again and they have given you your, your request for special attention on things, um, what you'll do then is sing the first phrase or the first half or the first verse, however it's laid out, of the song and ask them to repeat it. So, like in that song, I would sing, Let's talk about Jesus. And I would ask them to repeat that. Let's talk about Jesus. And then I would go to the next line and sing it, and then they would sing it. And he would go through and sing it, the whole thing, that first section together. And then go through the second part like that. Sing it all together after you've pieced it out. And then before you know it, the kid has already understood that it all comes together. And in their mind, they are piecing the puzzle together. And they can sing the whole song through faster than you think. But you've got to present it to them in the way that their mind understands it. Because let's face it, we adults, we make things overly complicated. To kids, it's simple. That's why the gospel is so much easier for a child to grasp than an adult. Because we can't make sense of simple things. And there's nothing more simple than the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we've got to teach our kids how to piece the puzzle together. Um... As you go through, one way that I like to do, I even do this with adults for that matter, um, to help them make uh, pitch associations throughout the song, is you, you use your hands or your fingers to associate high pitch and low pitch. So it's gonna, you would do something like this. Let's talk, because it's the same note. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk of his love. Let's talk about Jesus and heaven above. And you're gonna walk them up and down the ladder of tones and pitches to help them understand the difference and hopefully alleviate any monotonism that may have developed in them. You may have a kid that's completely pitch deaf. Tone deaf, can't carry a tune in his lunchbox because they don't carry buckets. They're too, buckets are too big. Carry a tune in his lunchbox. But at this age, we can break down any barriers of tone deafness or monotonism that may have developed because Really, the biggest reason a kid doesn't grasp music is because it's not exposed to it, and that's it. If it doesn't come from a musical household, it's not going to understand. But you place a child in a singing group and surround it with music on a regular basis, that kid will develop a musical talent. It will develop a musical ear. That's, that, that's how you alleviate the problem that we see so many people today that even on up in age, they just have no ear for music whatsoever. Most of the time it's because they didn't grow up in a musical home and just weren't saturated or exposed to music growing up. I've been playing the piano since I was old enough to get on the piano bench. It's not fair to many people that my mother taught piano lessons my entire life. So whether I was sitting down there playing or upstairs watching TV, I was always exposed to the piano. Even when I come home from school, piano lessons started. Guess what I heard all afternoon throughout the week? The piano. My whole life, I was exposed to music. Now, if I turned out tone deaf, it would have been a whole new chapter that I'd have to write. Because that would have been kind of odd. Because if all you do is expose a kid to music, and it naturally... Because music is a God-instilled ability. He created it, and He gave it. Everybody has the ability. Some people have just a mental block that we have to break down. And with kids, it's not that hard to break through that wall and get them to understand, okay? <laughs> so, using your hands to associate high and low pitches, and then go through the entire song, and then leave it alone. Come back next time and sing it. Don't expect to go through it once, and then, hey, y'all did really good. Let's go get in front of the church and sing it, because they're going to be like, 
And then you're going to have that majority of the kids that don't ever show up for practice anyway, they get up there and they're going to go. <laughs> and you're going, yep, yeah, I was afraid that would happen. So try to spread it out over a few rehearsals so that other kids are uh, exposed to the new song before you do it. Um, moving on to the next part, I kind of already hit this about kids who cannot carry a tune. There are ways that you can play games with them where you can ask them questions. And since we're at church, ask them a Bible question. And do it on a pitch and ask them to, re to answer or respond to you on the same pitch. Pitch association. You want them to answer on pitch or you say, I'm going to ask you a question at a low pitch. I want you to answer me at a high pitch. Or I'm going to ask you in a high. I want you to answer at a low pitch association. It's a big deal that a lot of adults don't understand because they were never taught. That wall gets harder and harder to break down as they get older. If we break the wall down with children, it's not an obstacle later on when they're in the youth choir and the adult choir, okay? So try to get them to grasp the relativeness of a higher pitch, lower pitch, high, low, high, medium, low, just somewhere. Help them understand how you, when you talk, listen to me. I do not talk monotone. I always go up and I go down. I'm, I'm very animated when I speak. So I'm using pitches even when I talk, and everybody does. But most people don't understand that that's what they're doing. So one way that we go get around that is to get kids to imitate sounds. Ask a kid to imitate a fire truck siren. What are they going to do? They're going to do it because they can imitate a fire truck. They're going to go, <laughs> that's not what they're going to do. They're going to go, Whoo! And if you use your hand and show them, you're going, Aah! the pitch goes up and it goes down. Get them to imitate a bird. Do birds have low pitches? How many birds do you hear going around going, tweet, tweet, <laughs> tweet, tweet? Maybe if they're hanging around the cigar lounge a little too long, they might, but that's about it. Most birds tweet on a very high pitch. It's all about associating them to things in their world, as small as it is, just helping them to click. Birds have high pitches. And that burr, burr, that you hear on the horn of the fire truck, that is a low pitch. But it goes low and then high and then back down to low when the siren goes whoo and it wails. So it's all about getting them to connect to the world around them and make associations, okay? All right, next page. We've got to teach them rhythm. But here's what you can get into a lot of trouble, so be very careful. If you're not confident in your ability to teach them rhythm, avoid it altogether and pray that, the God, that God will help you with this opportunity someday. The biggest danger is them taking it too far. So do not, when you're teaching them rhythm, do not encourage them to get up and dance to gyrate or to, for any kind of bodily movements that would be considered to be immodest or otherwise unacceptable in church or anywhere else by a child of God. You can understand rhythm and you can relate to rhythm without doing it in an ungodly fashion. But you probably will have a young girl, more than likely not a young boy, but most of the time you're going to have at least one young girl that has already been enrolled in some form of dance lesson, and their natural thing they're going to want to do is start moving their hips and shaking their bodies to the beat of the music when you talk about rhythm. That's not what we're trying to do. That's not what we do in church. I'm not doing it at home either. <laughs> but the point is that we have to teach them, even at a young age, what modesty and immodesty is. And here's another opportunity for a learning experience. There are ways to understand and express rhythm. So we're building a foundation for the rest of their life. Express rhythm through clapping, marching, walking, or even skipping. For example, if it is a walking or a marching song, it would kind of like be a... Uh, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers. I mean, my goodness, you can march to that song and it's laid out that way because it's lots of quarter notes. Onward Christian Soldiers Marching as to war And you're teaching the kid how to understand the rhythm of the song. If they're going... <laughs> in the song, you understand they don't get it. But if they see you doing it and your helper's doing it and other kids... One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Three, four. They will get that, and that will help them understand rhythm. 
But don't confuse them and use math and arithmetic and all these things. They're not going to understand that. All they need to know is to do what you do. So you do it right, and they'll learn it right, okay? Don't have to worry about teaching them 4-4 four, four time, and this is a 3-4 uh, time signature and things like that, okay? That is irrelevant at this point. If, it, if it's more of a running tempo, it would be eighth notes. Like if it was the same tempo as under Christian soldiers, but it's eighth notes, it would be more like this. You can picture somebody running down the street like this. Okay? But if it's more of a skipping song, it would be a dotted eighth note, which would be more like this. A dotted eighth note with a sixteenth. You can picture somebody skipping as they do a song to that. Or if it's a long, leisurely stroll, it would be a half note, which in 4-4, four, four, it would get two beats. So it would be one, two, three, four. One, two, it would be a nice, leisurely stroll. Dun, dun. Okay? And if it's a whole note or a song that has a lot of rests and holds and all kinds of stretched out things in it, you can just teach them that it's kind of like a, a holding pattern. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two. You do it just like rocking in a rocking chair. That's about all you're doing. You're just holding pattern. You can associate these things without being worldly, but it is important to them, for them to understand rhythm. Uh, do not try to teach them numbered meters, and remember that activity and motion songs are really helpful um, in the kids that learn and for them to associate music and rhythm. Uh, a good example of that would be the one that says, uh, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom for the enemy, but I am in the Lord's army. Yes, sir! Now, you can really get a kid to participate with gestures and movements like that and teach them that it's not a rose bowl or a rose parade, this Christian life. It's a battle. It's a fight. It's like being in the army because you have opposition that seeks to defeat you. <clears throat> so teach them from the beginning. And also you can teach them a little bit about rhythm. Be sure, first of all, that you teach them the song and then add the movements and gestures. And always teach them that the spiritual aspect of the song is the main focus over the fun factor or the excitement of the song, okay? We want to make sure that they don't focus on the, yeah, that's the song that we get to march. No, that's the song that we get to, and you remind them of the biblical theme and the biblical message that the song has, okay? This is also a great time in their life to begin teaching them reverence in church. The meaning of the word amen. Most kids have no idea why they say that. Anybody ever tell you what the word amen meant when you was a kid? It means literally, so be it. How many people that are adults say amen and really have no idea what they're saying? I mean, you get the preacher up there and he's preaching and he says, there's people in our neighborhoods going to hell! And somebody goes, so be it. <laughs> when they say amen, that's what they're saying. So be it. People say it out of habit. You've got to teach the kids to understand that it's a word. It has a meaning. Let's use it properly. And help them to understand why the generation of Christians coming up that Learn that, hey, my words have value. My words have weight. I need to make sure I use them properly. Be a good time to also teach them uh, appropriate singing volume for the song. Like, um, you definitely don't want to have a whole lot of excitement and enthusiasm in a song like God is so good. That would be a song of reverence and awe about how wonderful God is. So teach them to reserve and hold back a little bit instead of trying to get out and sing as loud as they can. Remember, volume isn't necessarily a strength. And you can also teach them proper choral technique, like how to sit when they sing, how to stand when they sing, the importance of watching the director, learning how to come in right and let off right, attacks and releases. All these things are very important. If you are able to, the ideal time for these kids would be to have a rehearsal that's only half an hour. You can't not expect a kid to sit down and be still for an hour. So uh, it seems to be very successful for a lot of churches to do it prior to Sunday school and while the opening assembly is going on and then as the opening assembly of Sunday school dismisses the kids would then go to the Sunday school class that's an ideal time to work with the children okay um, when you're selecting a song for the beginner age try to focus on songs that really just deal with God's love and how much he cares for his children that talk about the truths from the life of Christ 
Like silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And teach them the stories of the Bible. And they'll never forget it. Never will they ever forget it. Uh, you can teach them about God's revelation in nature and just teach them a song that tells them a story. Last of all, for this section, it's also a good idea to have a special name for them. We call them the Golden Harps at Pleasant Grove. Here at Bethel, they call them the Boosters. Everybody has their own, it should have their own name for it because, like we told, told you guys last week in the youth choir, that we want the kids to feel like they belong to something special, something important. So give them a special name instead of just saying the kids because some people are going to feel like a kid the rest of their life. We want them to belong to something special. Next age group is the primaries, which would be first, second, and third grade range, okay? Now, this age, they have reached the point where they actually can be occasionally used in the church services. Now, their songs are going to be primarily always sung in unison still, and they're still going to learn by imitation. Do not expect these kids to read music. Do not expect them to respond to you handing them a book. Best way I know to teach a kid of this age and the beginner age is to get a big easel like that one right there. Actually, that's identical to the one I've got. How about that? And get a big pad of paper, about one of those two by threes or so, that, kind of like what we used to use for win, lose, or draw back when people actually knew what that game was. <laughs> Y'all don't even know what that is, do you? Do you know what that is? You don't know what that is. Good <clears throat> night. <laughs> Come on. But anyway. Pictionary, okay, it's, a, it's an early day version of Pictionary. Um, so get that out and write out the words to the song in big letters for them so that they can start to associate it. And as these kids learn to read, they'll be able to read the words on the page. And also what that'll do is it'll teach the kid to focus on you. Because if you're leading them in the sanctuary, you get in front of them, get in the middle and hold that, they're going to look at you to look at the words most of the time. Usually the kids that are always doing this while you're singing are the ones whose parents don't bring them to practice anyway. So you don't have the chance to really work with them and help them. But eventually people start picking up and realizing, hey, my kid's the only one picking his nose up there. Everybody else is singing. What's going on? Maybe it's because you don't bring them to practice. It'd be good for your kid to learn the songs that we sing if he's going to sing. Okay. Um, understanding, understand this age group's behavioral patterns is important as well. By this time, their world revolves around them. Basically, the best way to sum it up is that they are self-centered. I mean, they do not like to share for the most part. I mean, they're learning, but at this age, they're concerned about what they can get out of something, and they're all about themselves. So keep that in mind. At this point in their life, they have become keenly aware of their individuality and some of their own abilities. They've begun to really get a, a hold of and grasp on the beginnings of interests and even talents. This age, a kid is going to understand that it likes guns or it hates guns. It likes basketball or it thinks basketball is stupid. I mean, this is the way, this is the age group where these kids are really going to start coming out with a personality. This is when it's a good idea to start introducing rewards, competitions, etc. They're a very good idea at this age. Um, you're going to notice that their attention spans are much longer than the beginner age. And they're going to voice their opinions about their dislikes and their likes. And they're going to be very strong. These kids will be black and white on every on topics. There's no gray area. They're not young enough to, to be spoiled with liberalism. They're going to be either yes or no, and that's all it's going to be. They're not going to, they're not going to give and take on anything. So be prepared. You're going to get some kids that's going to mouth off and say, I don't like that song. I had a little girl that told me uh, Sunday morning, she just kind of looked at me. She said, are we done yet? <laughs> and I just went, do you have somewhere you need to be? <laughs> and she said, yeah, Sunday school. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, it hasn't started yet. So? <laughs> I'm ready to be done. <laughs> I said, you're tired of singing already? She's like, yeah. And I was like, see, this is going to work good for Monday night. <laughs> Perfect illustration. Yeah. When she walked out of the room, I said, you've been hanging around your mama too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Yeah, this also is the age where you will start to see hero worship come out. At this point, they're going to love their music director and think that their music director is the greatest ever, the coolest ever, the best singer ever, etc., etc. Hero worship really comes into full force in this age, so learn to recognize it. Learn to work with that. Use it 
Don't abuse it. Make sure that you're keenly aware when they're giving you extra attention because you can use that to help to teach them more and understand more of what you want them to do. But don't take advantage of that because when they grow out of that, they might be, get a little embarrassed because they were the teacher's pet, etc., etc. You know how it is. Kids don't like to have all the attention because eventually they realize, man, nobody likes me because the teacher always calls on me. So be keenly aware that this is the age of hero worship, okay? It's normal, but this is a great way for you to build a very strong rapport with them. It's good to start branching out with songs that have more variety and complexity at this age. And it's also a great time to, start to begin teaching them the basics of musical theory. You're going to want to start teaching them the correct ways of tone production when they sing. Um, you're going to want to start teaching them the basics of diction when they speak. And one of the things that I have greatly, greatly confirmed, and that you will see too, is that kids at this age tend to mumble a lot when they sing. They don't understand the importance of pronouncing the words, or the correct term is diction. So you want to focus on helping them overcome and get rid of the annoying habit of mumbling. Because if they continue to do that, when they get into society, they're going to have a hard time getting people to pay attention to them because they don't speak clearly. One of the ways that you can, you can overcome the habit of mumbling is to get them to whisper the song because they can't manipulate the words and the sounds with their throat and their vocal cords because there's no vibration of the vocal cords, no air coming through as much. So they're going to have to really work on using their lips and their tongues in order to pronounce the word. So like if you, let's do Amazing Grace for example. If you were mumbling through Amazing Grace, you could go, Amazing Grace, how we love her. And you still got to grasp what I'm saying. But if I whisper it, the only way I can really get you to understand me is to use my lips and my tongue. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. So teach the kids to whisper the songs if you see that they're doing a lot of mumbling, okay? That's one way to really help them work past that. This is where you can begin to introduce them phrasing, learning how to um, how to breathe throughout a song. Uh, Amazing Grace is another good one. Look, let me, everybody get your hymn book and turn to 57 real quick. I want to show you what phrasing is. We're going to learn this when we study singing later, but I want to give you an example for tonight's sake. In any song, you can sing the song properly by following the punctuation of the song. Just like when you read the story, when you sing it, you still follow the punctuation. Now, this is how most people sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And what they end up experiencing is a great burn in their chest because they're not expelling all of the carbon dioxide that their body's converting. It's very shallow breaths and shallow output, but they're breathing in more than they're putting out, and eventually they start getting lightheaded, and then they have to go, Whew. you ever been like that? Where you just gotta get a deep breath, a cleansing breath, because you haven't been breathing in the song right? Notice the punctuation of Amazing Grace. Look at verse number two. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, comma, and grace my fears relieved, semicolon. How precious did that grace appear, comma, the hour I first believed. Now if you read it right, it sounds really nice. Sing it right too then. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Diction. Teach the kids to pronounce what they're singing. Otherwise, it's going to sound cute, but that's not what we're doing. We don't sing in church to be cute. We sing in church to worship. We want God to be sure that we're saying exactly what we mean to say. Okay? All right, finishing up real quick. Um, let's see. Go through them and teach them uh, the importance of singing with a relaxed jaw, an open mouth, and an open throat. Teach them good posture and singing phrase-wise rather than a breath every few notes. Rhythm with the, uh, with the primaries will be a lot more accurate than with the beginners. So still use physical responses rather than complex explanations and mathematical equations because these kids still learn how by... 
imitation or wrote, in other words, okay? In any song, the first beat is always the strongest. You can naturally feel it, but you also want to try to emphasize it as well. So, in Amazing Grace, the first beat would be the word may, so it would be like, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. You want to emphasize the first beat of the measures. And since these kids are going to be able to read, this is when it's going to be good to get your easel board out, start writing out the songs for them. Writing in, in parentheses, you know, uh, go back to the beginning or sing this line twice, something like that, to help them understand that you're going to repeat this area, okay? I break it down in colors. I have the first verse in one color, the chorus in another color, the second verse in a different color. And any notes that I put in there, I put it in black. The kids know you never sing what's in black. The title is in black, and the repeats, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are written in black. They sing the red, the green, and the blue. It's easy to understand that way. Last of all, in the junior age, you have your fourth and your fifth graders. And this is the peak of childhood. This is where they're going to start coming up and going over into the adolescent age and going into puberty and the voice changing and all these different things. This is where they're going to start having the greatest difficulty singing. So make full use of this age because this is the peak of their childhood. This is where you're going to have, for the most part, the most purest voices that you'll ever be able to work with. So make, make full advantage of it. These kids will be able to retain and memorize the songs. Uh, it's a very ideal time to introduce them to note study and reading the notes. You're going to deal with boys that will start to want to sing an octave lower at this age because they want to sound like a man. Especially if their director is a man. I've got a boy that's 9, 10 years old that nowhere near a voice change. But when he sings, he forces his voice to go down. I've tried to explain to him that if he forces it, he will damage his voice, and then when it's time for his voice to transition, it's not going to want to transition like it should. You have to teach them to take care of their voice, because that's their instrument when they sing. You've got to take care of it. Otherwise, you're going to end up 40 years old and sound like a hairdryer when you sing, because there's nothing left, because you abused it when you was a kid. I mean, how many of the, the, the rock and roll singers of the 70s and 80s that screamed when they sang, when they speak now, what do they sound like? Terrible. I mean, they sound all scratchy and just airy and breathy like they can't make a clear sound. It's because they destroyed their vocal cords. You have to learn how to cough without straining your voice, how to, how to speak loudly or yell without forcing it all from here because it damages your vocal cords. If you love to sing, you need to learn to preserve your voice, so that you can continue to sing as long as you're alive, okay? Um, <laughs> encourage them to sing on the proper pitch and let their voices naturally drop. You're going to get greater results with the awards and recognitions. Uh, you can teach them accountability at this age uh, by keeping track of, attention, uh, of attendance and participation. Granted, it's going to hinge on whether or not somebody brings them, but if they're out there sitting in the congregation when they should be in rehearsal, this is one way that you can alleviate that problem, and that does happen. So this is one way you can do it, because when they see that boy and that girl, the one of each, that gets the award at the end of the year for being the one that was had the, the best attendance record, they were always on time the most, they participated in every singing, this, that, and the other thing. Give an award, a, a pin for them to wear on the shirt to church, something, a trophy, what a certificate, something to draw attention and to recognize and to award, reward them for their dedication. Because again, it's a lesson to be taught that there is coming a payday for all that we do for the Lord. So we teach not bribery. Bribery by definition is enticing someone to do something that is illegal or morally wrong. It's not bribery. It's encouragement. We want you to show up. There are great rewards in serving the Lord. But you've got to be here to be counted among those. Okay, so... Uh, you can also reward them for their behavior, not just during rehearsals, but also during the services. And also reward them for being a regular attendee to their Sunday school class and to worship service and even to youth meetings like on Wednesday nights or whenever you may do it. And of course, you can also choose any other particular emphasis that you want to make. Last of all is the subject of discipline. This is something that you have to be very careful with, but it's very, very necessary. I suggest that you take time before you really jump to any conclusions to get to know your kids personally first. For all you know, I, and that's one of the things that I'm going to point out down here in just a little bit, but you, if you jump to conclusions, you're going to be 
you could do more damage than, than more benefit because you might have a kid that has a literal diagnosable defiancy syndrome or you might have a kid that um, is being treated for ADD and ADHD. Personally, I feel that one of the things that can really help people with ADD and ADHD is a good miner's belt. <laughs> hey man, where's Tony Malay when you need him? <laughs> but I understand that there are physical and mental uh, reservations for people that have been diagnosed with certain disorders. Personally, I believe that I'm an, I am an undiagnosed case, because I refuse to let the doctor tell me that I am, of adult ADHD. I really believe that I, if I'm not there, I'm borderline if they wanted to diagnose me because I can't sit still. I can't not do anything. When I'm on vacation, I have to do something. I can't just, I'm not the guy that sits on the, in the chair at the beach and relaxes. I have to be doing something. You'll find me on the water riding the waves, doing something, chasing crabs up and down the shore. I mean, I'm the guy that squirrel. You know, I'm, I'm, that's me. That's, that's the guy that I am. I'm always jittery. I'm always moving my feet, my legs. I'm humming. I mean, there will be times that even in silent prayer and I'll catch myself humming a tune because I can't, it just happens. There, and that, that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm, I really am fairly convinced that I, I would be considered in that department. I'm, my wife uh, on the marriage retreat that we went to this weekend, uh, we were asked to, what, what breed of dog would you use to describe your spouse? I, I said that my wife was most likened to a French poodle because they're, they're dainty, frilly, and they don't like to get dirty. <laughs> she said I was a chihuahua. Because they're super energetic, easily entertained, and man, they're always doing something. But they're very zealous. I don't believe in doing anything without doing it to my greatest ability and giving it my all. That's what chihuahuas are. That's why they try to kill everything that's in their way, even though they're never going to work. But man, if you ask them, they can take care of it and put them off, put them off. That's the attitude they've always had. So, you know, that's just the way it is. So be sure you balance genuine friendliness and mature dignity. Never talk down to the kids and always use praise much more than scolding. We want to reward good behavior more than we spend time calling out and fussing about bad behavior. Kids respond to excuse me, two rewards, but they also understand that if they cross the line, there will be discipline that has to be taken. You'll have to, act, and never, never be the only adult that's in the room with the kids because you'll never handle them all by yourself. You need mothers, helpers that can step in and take out a child that's being disruptive or unruly. Or if you're like me, if the kid is the one that's always the troublemaker, when they get called down, they walk out. Boom! <laughs> Solves me the problem of having to go out and say, come get your kid! <laughs> Um, let's see. Never use ridicule or sarcasm for discipline because kids don't get it. Kids do not understand sarcasm. They will not grasp it. They will think that you genuinely hate them and that you are wicked. They do not grasp sarcasm whatsoever, so don't use it. Uh, never try to outshout them. If they're talking and you're trying to, you just stand there and wait for them to get quiet. And then when it, they have recognized that they are out of turn and unruly, you speak in a quiet and a low, confident tone to remind them that you are in charge, not them. Be aware of also possible causes that can create unruly behavior. Number one, weather. Sunny days, people are a lot more friendly and cheerful. Rainy days, not so much. That's a proven scientific fact. I don't know that the whole full moon thing plays into people. You know, I know police officers that swear when the full moon's out, so are the kooks. But I think there's kooks out every night, whether it's a new moon, a full moon, or a waxing crescent, or a waning crescent, or a gibbous, or whatever else that there is out there. It, but it does get affected by the sunshiny days and the dismal rainy days. It could just be that they have misdirected energy. Help them to learn to channel that energy towards singing, not being disruptive. Uh, it could be that the kids just full plain rotten, and they resent control. That's not your fault. And God bless you if you have to deal with that. If it gets to the point where they become a distraction and you can't get anything accomplished, tell your pastor and talk to the parents and let them know that unless the kid is going to cooperate, he or she cannot participate. Hey, that's a good one. If the kid does not cooperate, the kid does not participate. Write that down. That's good. <laughs> I like that. Um, if the kid, the kid can also become distracted, so don't have a whole lot of flashing lights and neon signs inside your room or anything like that. Try to shut the windows in case there's a crocodile walking across the graveyard, because every kid's going to see that for some reason. Uh, they will possibly be unruly simply because they're imitating another child. 
Uh, you'll also see that they are desiring special attention because they might not get it at home. And also, like I mentioned, it could be because they have limited mental and psychological abilities. You have to learn to deal with that. You just have to learn to, to understand it. You might want to study on how to deal with children that have ADD, ADHD, and things like that because it seems to be very common in our society today. Uh, be sure to work in close cooperation with the parents of the children and make sure that you're in control of yourself. You lose your cool, you've lost it. You've lost the respect of the kids, you've lost the respect of the parents, you lose the respect of the pastor. Keep control of yourself, but most of all, rely on the Holy Spirit and He will bless you and the ministry before you very greatly. Okay, so you have a four question homework sheet and that's it. It's very simple, very simple. Uh, the first two are for you to give me what you think in your own words. The second two is just to research what, and to rewrite what we already learned tonight on the last, the last two, and that's it. Um, I'm going to give you your exam for this session because today is the, this is the last uh, lesson of this session. So next week we begin our new session, which will be musical theory. Yeah, intro to musical theory. I'm excited about that. So I'm going to give you all an exam this evening. Um, you have, I'll, let's see, I'll give you, how many weeks do you think I should give them to get the exam done? How many, how, what do you normally? I would like a week. But, well, obviously, but yeah, we that would be nice. A great too. Okay. So have your homework done by next <laughs> week for me. And if you can, I would like to have your exams back in two weeks. It's uh, 25 questions. It's very simple, straightforward. Follow your notes, and, it, and you'll have your answers. There may be a time or two that I ask for your opinion. When I do that, the only way you're going to get that one wrong is if you just absolutely don't write nothing down. So write something down. Tell me what you think, okay? All right. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll, we will uh, close. And I uh, want to thank everybody out in Nebraska and everybody on YouTube for tuning in one more time. We hope that studying on the uh, breaking the ice on the children's choir was a great help to you all. And we're going to bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us the chance and the privilege to be able to come together and to be able to call upon your precious name. And I ask you, God, that you would uh, bless each student that's been in here. Thank you for the session on building a choir, for allowing us the opportunity to examine and to delve into the different kinds of choirs in the church. And I know it was brief on the youth and brief on the children. But God, it, nevertheless, I really feel that it was still more in-depth than many of us has ever had in our entire life. So we pray that you would help us to expand upon that with the power of the Holy Ghost. Teach us, help us to grow, and help us to do greater things in the name of Christ, in the music of our church, and in the ministry of our church. We thank you for this place. Thank you for uh, Pastor Donnie Schumann, for Bethel Baptist Church, and for Bethel Baptist Institute, and for the opportunity to come and to study music ministry here tonight. We praise you, and we thank you, and we love you. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let me give you your exam.